Hello and welcome to the third in this series um, of the Doctoral Consortium, on the, um, which, is first, which is about the dark side of AI. The Doctoral Consortium um, is something that we set up in Digital Futures as a way of creating a kind of a, a, a global platform for doctoral researchers, whereby everyone around the world can, uh, can join the same platform. Uh, given the fact that often re doctoral research happens in small groups with, with an individual professor uh, all over the place, to make this single platform seem to be an important gesture so as to uh, as a kind of a way of, 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 of allowing everyone access to these debates. And that's, this is the motivation behind this and behind also Digital Futures itself that tries to use its, uh, its, 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 its online platform to break down not just the physical walls of the of the classroom, but also the social, economic, and political barriers that have traditionally kept certain people uh, or, or prevented certain people from having access to knowledge. We want to share knowledge. We want to democratize, democratize knowledge, and everything that we do is is uploaded onto our YouTube platform to be viewed for free for free from by by everyone. So today's session then uh, picks up on the theme on of. Well, maybe instead of the dark side of AI, we should say the potential dark side of AI. We kicked off with, I think, a, a kind of doomsday view, shall we say, uh, by Martin Ford, who um, takes the view that there will be ser serious problems in terms of uh, the future of work, albeit with a sort of optimistic outlook on his on his side. He kind of is positive. Uh, the, the 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 advantages I think uh, for him outweigh the disadvantages. The reason why um, we I've invited today uh, our two guests, Aaron Hertzman and Morgan Frank, is that the, they've both been involved in what is a very important article on generative AI. Um, Aaron Hertzman was the was one of the co-editors of uh, this with uh, Ziv Epstein, who at the time was at MIT Media Lab. Aaron himself um, has been a, a, prof a full professor at the University of Toronto um, alongside uh, such luminaries as Jeffrey Hinton uh, for 10 years. He's since moved uh, to Adobe, where he's a research scientist, and he's an affiliate professor at the University of Washington. Morgan Frank uh, undertook his PhD at MIT Media Lab, and he's now he's now um, he's now working uh, <clears throat> at the University of Pittsburgh um, in the uh, in, in the School of Computing um, and Information. Um, he's interested in the, in the complexity of AI, the future of work, and the social economic consequences of te technological change. And that, to, to, to a large extent, is what this particular article um, was dealing with. So um, uh, this is part of the series then about the dark side of AI. Uh, the article itself, and let me simply just uh, um, uh, uh, just put the, the kind of the, 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 the abstract up in front of it, was, was, was published, very high profile article, published in um, Insights, um, and, and fairly recently. Um, in the middle of, of June, um, uh, but in that, in, in the terms of the the speed of, of of development, speed of change in the world of technology, that's actually quite a long time ago. Um, and it'd be interesting. One of the things we can perhaps address in this particular art, in this particular session, is how things are changing and how things are emerging at this particular point. To my mind, this was a really important article because it laid things out, um, the considerations that we would need to address in the future. Um, about the impact of um, AI um, on, on the world of art in general, art, design, music, and so on, and especially of generative AI. Well, what was interesting, it was flagging certain issues, um, issues such as copyright, issues uh, uh, such as job displacement, that we've all, over the last few, few months since the publication of this article, have begun to realize are really very, very important issues. So. Um, I want to maybe start by inviting Aaron to just say a few words um, to maybe kick things off about what were the, the real motivations behind this article and what it was trying to achieve and, and broadly what, it's, um, uh, what, it, what, what the results were, what the findings were um, as a way of, of, of familiarizing those who are not familiar with the article itself. Aaron, welcome. Thank you for, for joining us. Great. Yeah. Thanks, Neil. Thanks for having me. Um, yeah. So this article came about, uh, started about a year ago. We have started having, discussing it. And I think both Ziv and I were pretty frustrated with the state of public discourse around generative AI. Um, there's a few kind of 
first impressions people have that sort of very quickly solidify into what the conversation is. Either it is democratizing creativity or it is killing art. And while there's some relationship to the truth in both those statements, they're both very extreme things that are, I think are really very misleading and, and give a bad guide for understanding the impact these things are gonna have. So with this article, we essentially had two goals. Um, the first was to provide some historical context and some um, understanding of these, of the, the real issues here. What's, what, you know, why those two statements don't really make a lot of sense and, um, or like why, you know, why it's not gonna kill art, um, but what, what the real um, promises of potential benefits and harms are. And then the second main goal was um, that, so we published this in Science, which is one of the main flagship journals. They, you know, this is for the AAAS. And um, so it targeted for um, people doing research in broadly in computing because generative AI, is in, in, in science in general, generative AI has potential impacts across all these fields. So for uh, a researcher, somebody uh, confronting these things for the first time, they might think one of these things, oh, it's just now it's the artist, now it's replacing artists or whatever. Um, and we wanted to um, provide that, that you know, a little bit more context and, and background for how to really think about that. Um, but we also wanted to provide um, directions for future study and places where we need to have better research that will help guide future decisions and policy and understanding how do we think about these things in the world. And for those purposes, we brought together experts in four areas, um, culture, art media studies being the first one, uh, economics, law, and copyright, uh, and uh, sort of fake news, fake media. So those, and we you know, um, put together sections, portions of the paper, combining all those different areas into here are the promises, potentials, survey of the past work, and uh, open questions for research. Now, of course, this is a very short uh, two-page piece that very quickly summarizes these things. So in order to go into a lot more de the depth that we would like to, we also have a white paper online, which is posted on archive, which is an expanded version of this. It has all the detail of all the references and nuances back and forth. Um, if so, anyone who really wants to um, go beyond the two page version, I would highly recommend looking at the long, long version. One of the <clears throat> challenges in publishing anything is these days anyway, is that there, anything is once it's published, it's almost out of date before it's published. And I think books are probably worse than journals, but certainly, my experience was having I, I was involved in the, the two uh, first books on AI and architecture, um, and by the time they came out, the dominant mode of generating images in those days it was GANs had been displaced or was displaced within within a couple of months by the diffusion models. In other words, um, things are moving incredibly rapidly, and as uh, and and the world of publishing cannot keep pace with this. Um, we, we, I mean, to the point that actually what in my the second edition of my book, we're talking about having a, a QR code. So you can scan that and refer to some kind of website that will um, update you on certainly some of the images and so on. So it, it is, I mean, in some senses, um, the world publication is is, 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 is is too slow to deal with the changes that are, that are going on in the world today. I mean, whatever we might say in terms of Moore's law, things are changing quite rapidly. Do you want to kind of reflect on, on, on that question about how we can, how can publications ever keep pace with the change that is happening? Yeah, I think, you know, there was definitely something we were concerned of and like things have changed a lot since we basically planned out the outline of the article in December. Um, but I think, you know, we didn't focus specifically on individual tools. We didn't talk specifically about um, the what was out then, now there's all this new stuff. But I think a lot of the issues, the hard historical context hasn't changed. Um, a lot of the broader issues haven't changed. These are, I think we focus more on, on long-term things. So I think that the, the main thing that maybe is relevant, a lot of the discussion has uh, improved in the discourse. I mean, there's still, I still think, see the simpl simplistic view of things quite a bit. Um, but I think people are getting more sophisticated as they uh, use these tools and get more understanding of how they actually work. Um, but yeah, anything which focuses on a specific tool is really going to be out of date very fast. Um, well, by, by the way, one other thing I, want, I just want to briefly acknowledge is that this is the work of, of many people, and they didn't let us include all the authors, including yourself, Neil, and Morgan, uh, also here. Um, and so lots of people worked very hard on this, and they just didn't let us put all the names into the byline here, but the full-length article has the, the, the correct author list. Yeah, no, I mean, I, 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 I think that's, a, that's an amazing thing. I mean, I... I, I 
sort of second that comment you made about well, bringing to be, together these people from backgrounds. And one of the, the most astonishing contributions, I think anyway, was in the, 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 the comment from the lawyers about copyright and so on. And, you know, we, we talk about these things as, as you know, artists and architects and speculate and talk about copyright as though we know what we're talking about. In fact, actually, to really have the experts involved is actually is, is an incredibly important thing. And uh, I just wish this could open up and become a book in itself, but of course it would suffer from being out of date uh, over time. I mean, one of the things I maybe also could raise as a, a sort of issue is, is that much of the um, the language that it's encouched in is, is a very um, carefully chosen, shall we say, uh, operating in the conditional tense. In other words, instead of saying will, it's would, or it's, it's, it's sort of shall, it, it should, or whatever, instead of, you know, it's all kind of carefully couched to, to, to not be, um, uh, to be very measured. Um, and of course, some of the things that that have that were sort of mentioned in, in a very prescient way, such as questions about, let's say, regulation. I mean, that's no longer we we should we should, but rather we must. You know, I think the, the, in the last couple of weeks, um, this famous meeting of the White House, that that when all these figures from the world of of AI came together to discuss regulation, it's now an important agenda. Um, it's, I mean, uh, would you want to comment on that, the, the way in which you had to put things in the conditional, in the conditional uh, rather than actually being straightforward about it and, or, or more yeah. assertive? Yeah. yeah, I think, um, you know, it's a tough line to, to tread because I, I genuinely, um, I, I lean towards these more new, nuanced takes on things. And like, I find the very simple black and white discourse very uh, frustrating. Um, I think, you know, and this is also, I mean, there's, there's, there's many factors, um, like, like I, you know, generally I find that, you know, these, a lot of the message I have in my work has been that these things are complicated. These simple takes are, any simple take is generally going to be wrong. There's, you know, there's short-term effects, there's long-term effects, different, they have, there's different effects in different domains and different, some people are benefiting more and some people are more harmed and um, the long-term effects may be very different. And this is, you know, the trend in history. I, I really like um, Myron Kranzberg, the historian. I came across reading Dana Boyd's thesis. He has a set of laws where he, you know, his first law is that uh, um, uh, technology is not not necessarily automatically good, but it's not bad either, nor is it neutral. And his point is that the effects are complicated, they're contingent on location and society, short-term and long-term are different. Um, and so I feel like, you know, there's a trade-off between, we can make these very strong statements about we must do this, and this is gonna be a, hugely affected, but, those statements, I think, um, in some way can be misleading. And also, this is such an overheated area. There's always a danger. It feels like someone's going to take a few sentences you wrote out of context and say, you think artists don't matter or whatever, but that sort of stuff you know, that I also want to avoid. Yeah, I mean, I guess that the, the, there's always a danger in any polemical statement that people make that is undialectical. In other words, you deliberately present things in the kind of, even though you might know the other argument, in order to make the polemic, you leave out the other side of the argument. And I know myself, and I've written a, a polemical book back in, in, in the Analytics of Architecture that I left out the counter argument. And then I wrote a subsequent another book, which was the kind of the dialectical other side of the argument. But one of the things, yeah. I, sorry, okay. One of the things I I I, um, I, 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 I make in, in my comment, my, one of the comments I make in my book about AI is that almost you have to see this. The, the, the analogy I use, which is probably is even is also too simplistic, is the the kind of the yin yang symbol a symbol you get that you see it in the Korean flag where you get this there's a there's a circle and there's a, a white half of the circle and there's a black half of the circle but in the white there's a black and it is a circle and in the the, the the black there's a bit of white in other words they're more dialectically connected in some senses um, and to my mind you know one of the the maybe the 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 challenges of AI is the fact that the 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 negativity or the the, the disadvantage came out of all the opportunities that it can offer. I mean, to my mind, it is these tools are so capable, and that's where, in some sense, the the danger lies. We need to keep it very, very, very kind of um, uh, balanced in how we we look at things. Maybe I could I also could I just want to pick up this one briefly because I mean I I. I we have a, this black and white sort of thing. We have this um, in, in England, <laughs> where I come from. We have a particular 
a breakfast spread called Marmite that people are very divided about. And they actually use this as a marketing tool. You either love it or you hate it. I don't know if you've tried Marmite. It's a bit like Vegemite in Australia. You either love it or you hate it. And that, to some extent, this is what you find in the world of AI. We're getting increased polarization between those two different camps. But there's a third camp that I've seen emerging, which actually comes from those who are working in the field of AI, who clearly see the advantages of it, but who are warning us about this. And of course, we have this Future of Life um, uh, uh, um, Foundation letter. We have, um, and maybe I could just ask you though, particularly about, about, about your former colleague at, uh, at, um, in Toronto, Jeffrey Hinton, who of course was you know, one of the great pioneers in, in deep learning, who is now kind of warning us about the uh, the potential dangers of uh, of AI. How do you? I mean, he's he, it's because it's kind of curious because he does take. He is in the end. He's 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 worried. He's very worried about the AI. Yeah. So I, I don't know specifically his view. Um, I mean, I do think that the the, the future of life kind of letter. Those, those things I don't um, buy. I think that it's a distraction from the real effects of these things. It's science fiction about some other, you know, it's, it's about the movie version of AI, not the real AI that we're actually building. Um, and I think that, that it distracts from these real potential benefits and harms of these software systems that are tools. And I, you know, I just, the, the, the phrase AI is so misleading. I just, I, I, we should, if it was up to me, we would never call it AI. We would just call these, you know, software systems that we are building. Um, uh, yeah, so, and in, you know, there's lots of speculation as the motivations implicit or not behind um, that doom saying um, that I don't know whether that's accurate or not, but I, I do think it really distorts the discourse. Yeah. Coming back to the article, the point of the article is to focus on what are the real probable benefits and harms of these things um, rather than in, you know, those things I really view as science fiction based on science fiction understanding ideas of AI. Could, could you just maybe just elaborate on the science fiction notion? What precisely do you mean by that? that uh, because the people like Max Tegmark are, are kind of, you know, and Elon Musk signed it and so on. These are people like in the, the kind of working industry in some senses with this. Um, um, yeah, and there's lots of other people working in industry who have the other view, which is the one I share. Um, people with, you know, uh, you know, people with very respectable backgrounds as well. Um, uh, so... We, in most of these the systems that are shipping now, like the LLMs and the image synthesis methods, are essentially they're um, data fitting algorithms. So you start with a large data set of some kind, you carefully design a mathematical function represented as a machine learning model, uh, fit data to that, and then do a whole bunch of work around that, like wrapper function, input and output, and tweaking the data sets to produce a piece of code that takes inputs and generates outputs. Mm -hmm. Um, so it's basically like, you know, what you learn in statistics 101, like curve fitting, but super turbocharged with huge data sets and large high dimensional functions and um, uh, large computing. And um, the these things operate in a way which is, it, it is code people write, it fits data. Um, and then you run things in certain ways, get things out of it. Now, the science fiction view is we have these media images that most of us grow up watching TV and films and reading books with uh, AI in movies that are you know, Terminator, Data, C-3PO, um, her, the science fiction presentation of AI that we're all exposed to is really genuine intelligence that is similar to how humans uh, operate. So these things are either, you know, like a little emotionally immature, like Data and Star Trek, or just our cuddly friends like uh, in uh, Star Trek, or they're psychopaths like in Terminator. They're, but they're basically human-like intelligences. And, um, we um, so calling it AI, I think, to most people, suggests these movie versions of intelligence. And uh, what's more, we know that people have a very strong propensity to infer intentionality and intelligence in things that we don't understand. Um, so, for example, the most famous example of the Eliza effect from the 1970s, where somebody, uh, Joseph Weizenbaum, wanted to poke fun at uh, traditional, like sort of Rogerian talk therapy. And he wrote this very simple therapist. It says, um, uh, you know, what do you want to talk about today? You type in your response and it says like, how do, what, what makes you interested in that? Or like, why are you concerned about that? And it has very, very simple rule-based systems for chatting with people. And the first person he showed it to formed an emotional connection with it, even though it's like, you know, today it would be like 20 lines of Python code. And so um, calling these things AI, 
having them speak to you in the first person to say, I am just an intelligent, you know, just in chatbot agent or something, um, it has this very, very strong propensity to guide people to think this is actual intelligence. Um, and it is really code, you know, more sophisticated than Eliza, 20 lines of code, but it is code nonetheless. No, I, I completely agree with that. I think the, the use of the first person singular, I, is kind of like, well, I mean, it's in a sense, you get this kind of, it reminds me of kind of Descartes, you know, if I think, therefore I am, you know, but the question ultimately is, is do these entities think? And I, I think this is a, a really, I mean, given the fact that Jeffrey Hinton's kind of now saying he thinks they do think, it's really challenging, but challenging, especially that I do, I agree that the real problem is anthropomorphizing these technologies. And as soon as you were, use the word intelligence, you automatically kind of conjure up the intelligence that we know that human beings have. And I think this is, this is, I think, what the central kind of question. I think one of the things we want to do is basically use inverted commas in any of these terms or to, to kind of clarify that it's not really the same thing we're, we're dealing with. There's a huge difference between if we can even use the term about intelligence between biological intelligence and, and human intelligence. Um, so I, I, uh, let's, I want to uh, just, uh, well, just before I move on to Morgan, because I wouldn't want to get um, Morgan to bring him in, because I find his work fascinating. But um, Aaron, just one final, final point. And, and um, I wanted to just ask you your opinion on, in the future of life letter that you mentioned, there is a kind of a, a, the kind of a key clause. They sort of say we're concerned about these black box large language models with what they call <clears throat> emergent capabilities. Now, this is a, a term that is, um, and I, as, as somebody who's outside the field, I mean, a, an interest in but inside the field of computer science itself, I find this an intriguing concept. Um, essentially, I think what they're referring to is the, the capacity for this system to. Um, learn languages, to be able to translate different languages, to learn to write code, and so on and so on. And I, I guess the, the, the key question is, is, what do you understand by this expression emergent capability? Is it the same kind of emergence that someone like John Holland, who was such a seminal figure, who wrote about emergence? Or are, are, they, are they misunderstanding what is essentially what you're describing as a purely mechanical process? And, and these manifestations of Curious behavior, you know, the larger the model, the more we see evidence of these things happening. What is your take on these so-called emerging capabilities? Um, well, I think it's one of these words in this space that can mean a whole lot of different things. And some, some people may conflate all these different meanings. In this case, um, you know, broadly, it can mean almost anything, you know, how a colony of ants can uh, appear to be coordinated and work together to you know, solve sophisticated tasks, even though there's no one and directing them and telling them all what to do, um, or a society can have all these emergent behaviors. Um, so, um, you know, I don't know why to speculate too much. I assume that they are saying that these things are, they're implying um, uh, emergent intelligence. Um, and there is a question of like, you know, how does intelligence come from biology um, that is not, there's, you know, there's no homunculus directing the brain, you know, how do, how do we think these things? They may be implying that these things are that emergence is going to produce um, hard to predict, hard to control behaviors that are akin to, or that they're saying are, you know, Skynet psychopaths. Mm -hmm. Although, <clears throat> although John Holland, his notion of emergence is more a kind of sense that sees things being reconciled within a system. Like a, he gives the example of a city of a, a kind of self-regulating. So it seems like it's. Well, it's difficult to understand what he means by positive by emergence, but it's not it's not this kind of out of control kind of version that some people have um, of this. And I'm trying to remember the name of the person who writes about this on Wired magazine or used to. Um, it's more about a system self-regulating in some ways. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I think a, a stable system can reach homeostasis and be self-regulating. Um, but you could also have emergent behaviors that are ultimately uh, self-destructive and spiral out of control. I just don't. I, I I think that's again a distraction from the real issues here. Yeah. No. Okay. Um, so Morgan, I um, just want to bring you in here, and, and I mean your kind of interest in the future of work, which is, um, uh, I mean, I guess from since you finished your, your your PhD at MIT Media Lab, of course, the way notion of work itself is 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 kind of changing, and the the future itself is upon us early quicker than we. We thought um, because of these, I guess, broadly, and to, lose, to use a, a loose expression, 
Moore's Law kind of series of, of developments. But since this article has come out, you know, we've seen um, direct evidence, shall we say, of concern within the workforce, especially in the kind of Hollywood uh, 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 and writers and, 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 and actors, their concern about the about their, their work. Do you want to uh, kind of comment on how things have evolved in terms of the future of work, which is no longer the future of work, it's, it's work it's itself now, how things evolved since the article yeah. came out? Yeah, sure. So these generative AI tools, they're uh, sort of fundamentally different from the technologies that future of work researchers were thinking about even just 10 years ago. We discussed this in the, in the science article too, but the traditional paradigm for thinking about technology and how it impacts workers uh, is this theory called skill bias technological change, which I'm going to grossly oversimplify, but in broad strokes, it suggests that workers who do non-routine cognitive work are made more productive by technologies in general, and sort of lower skilled workers who do repetitive physical tasks are more likely to be replaced by robotics. And this has been the prevailing wisdom for more than a decade now. Uh, and with this paradigm, you would also conclude that creative workers are doing non-routine cognitive work. Usually there's some physical elements too, but creativity is often treated as an example in this literature of what can't be automated because it's hard to write down a rule-based system that can do uh, creativity. Uh, and now it sort of depends exactly what you mean by creativity, but these generative AI systems are raising concerns for the future of creative workers, at least. And in some cases, and for some people, uh, they believe that generative AI is actually being creative itself. Again, this claim sort of depends how you define creativity, um, but it, it just goes to show you that there's a big hole in this theory that's been the foundation for this literature for years, and it's causing the whole field to shift and try to find some new tools for addressing these questions about technology and the future of work. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess I'm, I'm in the camp that's been skeptical about, and especially there was a report by two scholars from the University of Oxford who was looking at kind of how the, the, the susceptibility of certain professions to be, um, uh, uh, to be, to be technologized. And, and, you know, the architecture was rated kind of as a creative industry, rated quite okay. It was like number 70 out of 700. In other words, it was one of the least likely to be automated. But um, that, I, as someone who's worked in an architectural office, where frankly, there are a lot of hugely tedious tasks anyway, is, is kind of like a, is, is, is I think a bit of a myth. Um, um, I mean, because I came out of Cambridge and I ended up sort of, you, know, you, you, you think you've, you know, you've been to one of the best universities in the world, you're ready to change the world, and then you go and work in office, the first thing you do is look at door schedules and, and kind of the really tasks that need to be, to be automated. But there is a kind of a theory that's been put out there that basically, you know, maybe what we call creativity is more straightforward um, than, we, um, than we think. And I want to just put to you a couple of examples. One is, I mean, a more recent example, which is, which is uh, um, uh, the work of, um, I'm, I'm just, it was Stephen Wolfer. Um, he wrote a, um, a very short book on, on chat GPT, but he makes this comment that if these generative models and, and the GPT series are, are based on this really kind of strangely straightforward uh, process of predicting the next word and out of this, everything else comes, and his comment to that is basically saying, well, um, uh, uh, that doesn't that suggest that actually the way that we write is actually a little bit more straightforward than we think? And um, I mean, which is, of course, you fall into that trap of trying to compare these two different domains. But uh, I'm always tempted to think, well, maybe that might be the case. Mm. And maybe the second one I could I should mention is... Um, and I'm just trying to struggle to remember his name as well. Um, El Gamal, I think it is. It's I, I know that Arab must know him. He's a, um, he wrote this um, uh, algorithm. Um, I think creative uh, um, uh, um, Gans. Um, what, what in the comment that he makes there is that you know, in a sense, what's happening. And I should mention just briefly. Actually, Aaron has a background in art himself. That he is 
he studied art uh, alongside computer science um, as a student, and he's been generating um, work um, using DALI. There's a whole website of his work um, on that thing. But what this, um, what he was basically saying is, there's a canon, there's a canon to the world of um, of, of art, uh, and if you want to do something, you've got to broadly keep within that. And his his model was basically trying to keep within it, but just nudge the edges and do something that looked different, but was still recognizable within that domain. Do you want to comment on those, those two, two different examples? Yeah, sure. Um, so uh, Wolfram's, Wolfram's conclusion is actually echoed uh, by a few other scholars who focus on things like cognition and linguistics. Uh, I remember reading a blog post from Noam Chomsky that reached a very similar conclusion, arguing that the brain largely doesn't, doesn't work by doing this probabilistic calculation based on what you've seen already, uh, and that we don't learn as we're growing up the same way that we've taught uh, chat GPT or these other large language models. Uh, and for me, it's made me think critically, like, yes, maybe there are, I'm, I'm not a cognition scientist or a psychologist, um, you know, so it's out of my expertise, but, you know, maybe there is uh, a way or modes where we're operating, where we are doing this probabilistic calculation. So I will bet that the, the whole series of statements you just made that you did not plan those out beforehand. You kind of maybe had some markers that you wanted to hit and then you figured out what to say along the way and you managed to do that. And it wasn't very proactive, but your brain figured it out somehow. Uh, and so for, again, not being a cognitive scientist, but for me, there's, there feels like some parallels there. Uh, to, your, to your second comment here, I'm actually more reminded of work from the philosophy of science. I'm thinking about Thomas Kuhn's work where uh, he argues that one of the major sources of paradigm shifts in a field of science is when there's a, a technological advance in another field of study that enables your field of study to now do something different. And I think one of the takeaways from our science article is that that's, that's what we think these generative AI systems are. It's a new tool, it's a new medium, uh, and it will create new opportunities. And maybe that leads to an artistic paradigm shift. Uh, and we're sort of waiting to see how that plays out. Yeah, I mean, just to pick up on that, I mean, I guess just searching for the name, you know, I, 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 that was actually a very interesting kind of model, you know, the, the markers and so on, that I had kind of sketched out a sentence I wanted to say, and I was searching for the names. And of course, fortunately, the names came to, uh, eventually came to me, but um, but I completely concur with that. And I just wanted to kind of like, you know, and I, I do think that there are, well, this I think, you know, this is just me just speculating as, a, as an architect kind of thing. I mean, who am I to say anything? But, uh, you know, I, I do think what is interesting is, is, is to speculate about whether, whether, and when we're creating, you know, works of art or indeed uh, speaking a sentence, and to what extent we are sort of doing a little bit what is happening in these generative models. In other words, there is this database, this huge, enormous database of examples of what is said in particular contexts, you know? And, you know, so for example, you know, there are some things you do like automatically almost, there are things that you say in a certain context, like, thank you, well, don't mention it or something. You, you kind of, there are certain formulas out there and I, I often wonder whether that's not what we're doing when we're speaking, is just searching through these uh, contextualized examples of what you normally do in this situation, as indeed, now this is maybe the bit controversial point, is as indeed, you know, um, if we, we're doing in the, in the visual domain when we're working with, you know, um, designing, which in some senses, you know, almost like, what would someone design in this context? And you know, automatically we start thinking about, oh, a house, or oh, I don't know, a house is kind of thing, or, or you know, whatever. And of course, that database is, is influenced, if you say train as an architect or a musician, by you know increasing that size. And oh, I know even more about what a house might be because you know, it could be this, this. Is that is that a do you, do you, do you buy that, or you think that's just a kind of um, a, a kind of subjective speculation? Yeah, well, you know, again, I'm I'm sort of not trying to to guess too much about cognitive science here, but uh, one of the things I've seen with these large language models is that they are very uh, context aware, but they're also good at connecting the same concept across different contexts. And I think that's something that's very hard for us to do at the scale that these large language models are able to do. So, 
uh, specifically, they're able to make analogies based on whatever it is you're talking about and make that connection in other domains. You can see this, for example, when you start discussing an idea with a large language model and then say, make a joke about this or write a poem about this, this science concept or some, some something that happened in history. Uh, this is requiring a very sudden context shift. And it's something that would be very hard, I think, for most of us to do. So for example, if I asked you to write a poem in the style of the night before Christmas about architecture, uh, it's something I believe you could do, but you wouldn't do it quickly. Uh, even though you love architecture and you're familiar with the poem, uh, it's a tough thing for us to do, but it's something that's easy for these systems. So the, the fact that it's able to create connections between contexts is really powerful for me. It's also something that I think online search systems like, like Google, for example, they kind of enable this as well a little bit. Sometimes you search a, a phrase or a term and you uh, get a bunch of links that have nothing to do with what you're actually searching for. Uh, so that would be an example, but having this ability to iterate with the system creates a new uh, interface that I think is a little more powerful here. Yeah, I want, just wanted to share with you some some findings that I had. I mean, like like Aaron, I've been kind of dabbling um, in the domain of uh, of, um, of, of Dali mid journey. I mean, I think uh, Aaron was using Dali primarily. I've been using primarily mid journey. But one of the the phenomena, one of the phenomena that I managed, I came across was, um, you know, is is how associative it is in its logic. In the sense, you know, it's not. We use the term prompt engineering as though it sounds like it's a very precise and objective the, the, uh, technique, but increasingly I find it's more alchemy. In the sense, I'm, I don't mean that in a kind of uh, it's it's just that it, it, it's so complex that it's not as straightforward. So, for example, one of the techniques I tried doing when I was generating buildings was to put in the name of um, of, uh, of an artist to see yeah. what how that might impact the outcome in terms of, and I was particularly interested in color, how I might bring in an artist that was um, bright colors. Um, and I, I so I used using a, a, the name of a, um, an Australian um, um, indigenous artist and uh, who had bright colors. And sure, I got the bright colors, but I also got the kind of outback in the landscape, you know, and I got the kind of the, the um, uh, uh, what are the name of those trees there? You know, it, it was kind of, it was entirely Australian and the quality of light also. And I also, I tried by uh, a similar thing, I tried a, an Inuit artist from Northern Canada. Um, and uh, I, I got a building, but I got a building in snow. Uh, in other words, it was very, very context aware. And, and I guess we also, in the way that we think, are also associative thinkers, and I, I um, uh, I've not really read up on this, but I certainly know it's a kind of issue. For example, when we are in a kitchen, we see that the cooker, the the hob is bright red. We know not to touch it because we associate red with getting burnt. Um, or indeed, uh, I don't know if you know the story from uh, from Proust, uh, *La Recherche de Pompidou*, the kind of Madeleine cake. So you 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 bite a Madeleine cake, and all of a sudden, that brings with it memories and associations of what it was, you know, when you first had Madeleine cakes or whatever. Uh, and that makes the thing <clears throat> extremely complicated as a as a as a, um, um, in, in terms of trying to write a prompt that, that's going to get it right. Does that does that ring true with your experiences or indeed both of you for that matter? Um, yeah. Yeah. Just, Go ahead, Aaron. Yeah, I, I just want to say that all, all this stuff you're talking about, like to me, that feels like that's that's really the, the right way to go about understanding these things to some extent that like you're learning how to use it as a tool, whatever it's quirks and what are its features, what is it good for? You know, it is superhuman capability to write poems as compared to, you know, the average person, um, certainly compared to me. Um, and there's other things in which it just makes absolutely boneheaded idiotic responses uh, and different versions are, have different capabilities, but people probe into like, it just gives completely wrong information to some of those stupid questions, simple questions, or things that, um, uh, or sometimes to, to things that people would not know are stupid answers. Um, so it's really understanding its capabilities of the tool are really, I think, the best way to go about understanding it and using it. Yeah, so uh, for, for me, um, you know, Aaron, your, your comments remind me of recent work from Ethan Mullock, who's at uh, Penn in the Wharton School, and uh, he's him, and then I think Eric Green Olson at Stanford has some similar work as well, basically showing across a few different domains that 
the uh, large language models when given randomly to some students or experts and randomly not. So you have a random control trial. Basically, it has the effect of whoever isn't an expert or is low rated to begin with, they become more similar to the experts, but they don't exceed the experts. Uh, so it sort of gives you a sense for maybe how these tools will, will change the playing field. Um, but it's not pushing over the border. It's not pushing into yeah. the new frontier. I've seen this myself uh, where, especially for technical writing, for, for example, academic papers, where to get a tool like ChatGPT to produce an introduction section that would be actually useful requires so much direction that I might as well write the intro myself at that point. Mm -hmm. Um, so that, I don't know that that's, that's sort of, again, pointing to this idea that like, it's, it's able to make analogies if you point it in the right direction, but it's not really hitting that emergence we were discussing earlier. And, and probably for people like us, we've spent a lot of time practicing the skill of writing introductions and things like that, but it'll be yeah. super interesting to see how, I mean, and I, you know, like I'm used to writing on a computer, not writing with a quill pen or a typewriter. And those are different skills where you can't erase and it's harder to rearrange text. It'll be really interesting to see how students who are now learning to write using these tools, how will they work when they become professional writers? Yeah, or even grad students who are in a country that publishes in English, but English isn't their first language, right? Mm -hmm. So these are students who still have the right ideas, uh, and it's really just a matter of the communication the interface. Yeah, yeah. I mean, maybe I could just pick up on the question of the expert, because I think this is something that you, we were talking about yesterday. We had a session on digital futures on, on um, different forms of, of interdisciplinary work, shall we say. And we're seeing you know, fashion designers doing architecture, we're seeing architects doing fashion designers design fashion, and so on. You're kind of getting a blurring of the boundary, but not quite. You know? And I think in the end, um, it, it does privilege the notion of... Um, the I guess in, in what we do, how we described in in, um, in in the GAN model is kind of interesting at this point. You, you've, got, you've got a generator, and you've got a um, you've got a discriminator, and, and the generator. I don't think we're that good at generating, and I think what it does these systems is actually give us more ideas. They it, it kind of enhances and it augments and becomes a prosthesis to our imagination, as it were. But what we're really good at is is actually at discriminating. You know, we quickly smell a perfume and, and, and immediately know whether we like it or taste the cocktail. So we have these capacities. And it seems to therefore privilege the notion of the expert, the discriminating expert, shall we say, who's able to judge these things. And we are good at judging. But what that then presupposes is that we are experts. You know, and I think that what I do, I mean, I can very quickly use these things. I've got a particularly good prop that can allow me to generate as it were a kind of a, 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 a fashion catwalk in a matter of minutes and, and it, it's terrifying in some senses but my problem is i don't know whether it's good fashion or not i i can look at the image and i don't know well would that be easy to fabricate and, and, and i think in some senses it also reinforces the notion of the expert you know it, it kind of makes it very clear that you have to know what you're talking about to to really move forward yeah this reminds me of some examples that were been popping up over the last few years of people using uh, these increasingly more complex chat GPT iterations to just give it a data set and see how close it can get to producing a novel research study based on just the data. And you see these examples, yes, it, it runs some regressions and it knows about the data, the different columns in the, in the data set, and it does produce something that makes sense and in some cases is even internally consistent, but it's not novel or interesting enough to be published like that. You still need the curator on top to push it towards something that would be interesting enough to get to peer review, for example. Maybe, maybe I could just, just pick up on that. And there was one comment that I, I don't know if I got the right thing here. Um, uh, well, I should just say this is the, you can't read this on your screen probably, but this is the article itself, just two pages. But somewhere in this second page here, I'm not sure I've got the latest version here, but let me, um, um, yeah, this comment here, however, the production of creative goods may become more efficient, leading to the same amount of output with fewer workers. Um, I guess one of the kind of questions is that, um, um, is, is that in terms of, of work? Um, there are two issues that I came across, all these I um, 
I kind of began to think are significant, um, although I can't really talk with any authority because I'm not an economist, and I, they were kind of left out of the equation. I think a lot of people in the world of architecture, I've almost not, not come across anybody who seems to think that it's going to affect the um, uh, employment, whereas there are people out there who are experts in the field, um, some of them taking a very dramatic line in, in thinking, um, you know, very extreme, that, that do think it's going to have an impact. But there were two very, in some ways, to, to, I think we need to be kind of precise to understand the mechanisms at work. And I mean, what are the the problems of that earlier study that we were talking about, the um, the study about the, the future of work and the um, that was done by these two scholars at Oxford? It, 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 it kind of, first of all, it made the, um, the, the, the direct comparison between AI and humans as though it, that was the issue. But it seems to me increasingly that what we're talking about is, is something else. In other words, an augmented human that, that, that has this capacity versus someone who's not using AI. And, and what, this is one of the things I've been mentioning um, in my talks is that the real comparison then is someone using AI versus someone not using AI. And, you know, um, and one comment that was made, and it was, I think it was made in a flippant way and I'm, I'm probably taking out of context, but it was, was a simple comment that, you know, one person using AI could achieve as much as five people not using AI. Now that's, that is when it comes to a discipline like architecture, where there's so many different tasks involved, you, you, you've, got to, you've got to specify which task it is. And I think in terms of, let's say, ideation, in terms of generating ideas, you can do things on mid-journey very quickly and they can be rendered very quickly. I mean, it would take a, you know, a week for someone um, to, uh, to render that um, in, in, uh, by hand, as it were. Um, so there, there, are, there are different tasks. And of course, it doesn't kind of, doesn't say when. And that's the crucial issue to me is, is the time because we're, you know, things are happening so quickly. But anyway, that speculation that um, uh, that, 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 uh, that really that's the comparison we should be making is, I think, a very significant one. And the other one I wanted to throw out there was, um, and it goes back to this question about doing things efficiently um, and doing it, you know, uh, w w much more quickly. And, and, and that surely has an impact on on the, the the market the the, the marketplace of work in the sense that let me just explain what I mean by that. The real difficulty uh, that I've seen, and it's a challenge. I was just yesterday I was talking to an architect who was educated in China, and and she was telling me that in China nobody wants to become an architect anymore. It's just you know it's not one of those professions you want to go into, um, uh, and it's become very unpopular. And I. I sense that possibly the reason for that is being that the kind of there's been some fee bidding going on in in China, whereby you know instead of the standard, and of course this is more complex as well because there are many different ways of calculating, let's say, a fee, but instead of a standard fee that, that might be let's say five percent, and that's what architects make their money from is a percentage of the building cost. Instead of a standard fee, people are, are outbidding each other, so you're getting like one percent or two percent, you know, really cutting things down. Now, when you think about that, when you think about that, I mean, in a way, this is, there's only a certain number of buildings that we produce. And out of that, a certain percentage of money that's coming into the profession of architecture. And of course, I'm, I'm not quite sure how it applies to other, other industries, but architecture is particular in that regard. There's only a certain amount of money. And if you're outbidding people, um, because it's much more efficient, because you can use these tools to do more, um, and therefore you can do it for less, then the sum total of money coming into the profession is reduced. So if it was reduced from five to two, you've only got 40% of, the, of the, the capital coming into the profession. Does that make sense to, to someone working who's been working in the future of work? Yeah, sure. So, um, so I would say that the broad consensus is that, that I agree with too is that uh, when a worker is made more productive because there's a new technology, for example, it's really unclear what that means in general. There's so many contextual factors you need to consider. So the, the go-to example for this would be, uh, maybe I'll, I'll ask you and Aaron to vote here. Uh, what do you think happened in the US in terms of national employment for bank tellers with the introduction of automated teller machines, ATMs? So there's, there's three options, right? National employment increased, stayed the same, or decreased. Do you guys wanna venture a guess? Well, I, I've heard this story before. Uh, I, 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 I think that I would, I would, I would go for the counterintuitive one. I mean, I would think that just that, because I'm asking the question. Yes, right? exactly. exactly. No, I, no, I, but I, but I, 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 
I get your point. That I'm, I'm sure the number of back that, that they increased in some way, but maybe you could just uh, elaborate. Yeah, I sure, haven't... exactly. Yeah, so it's tempting to think that employment decreased because ATMs now did a lot of the work that bank tellers used to do, but actually it increased. Uh, and there's two reasons that are pointed to for this. The first is that uh, ATMs made it cheaper to open bank branches. And so a lot more bank branches sprung up across the US. Each one was smaller. They employed fewer bank tellers per bank branch, but on aggregate, it's a net increase in employment. Uh, and so this would be called, called demand elasticity in economics. And it's, it's well understood in, in equilibrium models. The second thing, which is not well incorporated into equilibrium based modeling, is that the skills required to be a bank teller changed from requiring money handling and numeracy skills to instead requiring more social skills. And that's because uh, now if you go talk to a bank teller, probably it's because there's something wrong, right? You're going to complain, you want customer service, you want uh, uh, the, the social touch, or maybe uh, you're signing up for a new service. So it, it, the, this shift reflects what part of the bank environment, the bank job, the technology could do. And the workers had, the occupation had to shift its skill content to reflect that change. So in the context of art, uh, yeah, I mean, I could imagine that these tools like uh, uh, image generators make it easy to rapidly generate uh, design images or architectural images. And, and these large language models make it quick to generate points for a blog post that you can sort of then fine tune later as you go. So it's accelerating the ideation process. Uh, but exactly how work will shift to complement this new ability uh, remains unclear. And exactly the extent that uh, the consumers for these creative goods will either scale elastically or inelastically, their demand for creative products also remains unclear. For many people, this bank teller result is a surprise. Uh, for example. And because of that, we need to be careful about suggesting how uh, the demand for creative goods will shift moving forward. Yeah, I just maybe one thing to just point out, which I think is interesting, um, especially to Aaron, given his kind of background in, in the world of art, is, is that, and this is a comment that was made by Rem Kohlhaas, one of our, our leading architects, is that the real, the problem about architecture is that we are paid a percentage of the building cost. That's how it's defined. You know? And, and uh, uh, it doesn't matter really whether you're the best in the world or the worst in the world, you're still going to be paid the same. Whereas in the world of art, you're paid as according to what the market will pay for you. I mean, so if you're, you know, whatever, Michelangelo, you'll get a million dollars. Whereas if your your work is rubbish, you'll get nothing. And that I think is, it makes, there's a different model um, that applies to architecture. Um, compared to art or indeed to music. Now, what do you make of that particular model and the challenges for, for, for the profession of, of in the construction industry? Oh, was that a question for me? Or That's for you, Morgan, Morgan yeah, yeah. It's a, yeah. Yeah, so I mean, I don't, I'm not familiar with the architecture industry in particular or, or the, the fee structure, um, but you know, you could imagine that if, if prices go down, because it becomes faster to produce designs, at least because maybe the ideation part is accelerated, maybe the other pieces remain unchanged. Um, you know, you could imagine that the same budget goes further and maybe there are now more opportunities, more jobs out there for architects to take advantage of, more contracts specifically. Uh, so we need to see if that, if that will actually be the case. Um, and in that scenario, it could lead to maybe uh, lower fees per contract, but more contract volume in total. Uh, if it's the case that technology makes it easier for anybody to do the whole job of an architect, maybe the remaining parts of the job are not the technically uh, the technically um, hard parts of the job. I'm not sure if that's the case, but if it is, then technology can have the effect of actually democratizing a certain uh, a certain occupation, a certain style of work. So for me, for example, my, my background's in like math and economics and complex systems, and I have no formal training in any type of art at all. I don't have an artistic bone in my body, um, uh, but I can use uh, Midjourney to create these high quality images, high quality, at least compared to what I would create myself. Um, and so in, you can see in that sense that maybe more people have access to this marketplace in that scenario. So because of this, you can just start to see how many layers there are to this 
a problem of trying to forecast what this a new technology that really reshapes the process uh so many layers to have to account for what will happen and it's very hard to see moving forward mm -hmm. and, and there's so, so many historical uh situations where similar things have happened you know photography invented or presented publicly in 1838 and painters say this kills art because it replaced artists um and uh then you know portrait painters essentially did lose work because the the more mechanical process of making a portrait could be automated um filmmaking i think is another place where there's this continual thread of um improved automation that has made filmmaking much more widely widespread so you know Filmmaking invented at the end of the 19th century. By the 1950s, you have just not counting the actors or sets or you know writing, just filming things. It has a team of people that manage the camera, uh, and then another team of people that manage the editing process and cutting strips of film and taping them together, and all the you know, re photography and all that. Now you know Steven Soderbergh makes entire feature films with his cell phone, um, and then but. but we still have feature films that are big productions that have much, much more sophisticated special effects. And our TV shows can do like the Mandalorian has these digital sets that make it look so much better than any you know, movie from the 1950s. Um, but what's more, we have so many people, more people making movies, streaming them on YouTube. And some of that actually becomes an on-ramp to um, artistic or professional success as well. So it's really, the amount of filmmaking has gone up both in the small scale, the large scale, you and I can make movies in ways that we couldn't have 100 or 50 years ago. Yeah. 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 So we, we talk about uh, this in the paper too, and we point to the Industrial Revolution as a well-documented example of what Aaron just described, um, where all of a sudden with these manufacturing facilities and, and factories, uh, you were able to take what was traditionally artisanal goods, textiles, ceramics, for example, uh, it required a lot of skill. Artisans made these things. And all of a sudden you could produce them en masse uh, using low-skilled factory workers. And all of a sudden, uh, if you want, it, be, it became a luxury good to get uh, one of these handmade ceramics or textiles. So this is, this is something that happens time and time again. Uh, you know, we can probably learn from that a little bit as we consider artists moving forward. Let me just simply unshare my screen. We've been sharing the same thing for too long. And, uh, it, it, so, um, um, and I just want to mention that we would like to it would invite some questions from our audience here. Uh, that we'll be followed both on YouTube um, and also in this, the Zoom group here. If you have some questions, please um, put them in the in the chat. Um, there probably is some already. I've been watching it too carefully. Um, yes. Um, so, but I, I guess that the. the so, I mean, I'm just following on from that uh, comment, uh, Morgan, kind of like, in a way, you can see how, you know, something like the mobile phone, the cell phone, is, it was an interesting example of, you know, when the price came down, then there were more available. And actually, the market kind of adjusted. It was intended for, I mean, the, the, the apocryphal story was intended for, for rich businessmen. And it was the point where it became, everyone is using that there's something, the price came down. The same, I think, with air conditioning and so on. There are models in history for where that plays out. But in some sense, the problem for architects is that, is that you know, okay, you can be more efficient and do this more efficiently. But that's only like, you know, clearly it, it's 5% of, we get 5% of the fees, presuming that's 5% of the overall project, as it were. In other words, there are other considerations. So unless the whole industry of construction is itself um, automated in the same way and more efficiently, buildings are not gonna get any cheaper. Uh, and in fact, there are other factors such as, you know, cost of land and God knows what that mitigates against that. So it's not as though we can just bring the price down of, of, of buildings and therefore there'll be more buildings built like mobile phones. It's actually a different uh, situation entirely. Yeah, sure. Uh, you know, perhaps perhaps this shows my ignorance of the architectural industry and construction. Um, but uh, your comments about China made me wonder if some of it is that construction is so streamlined. And it maybe limits how much, uh, how many free variables there are that could lead to other designs to invade the space. Yeah, um, but it, it's certainly a very complex, complex equation. Um, so, uh, it, uh, yeah, um, no, I, 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 I kind of, I feel that that there is, you know, much more a kind of adjustment and self-regulation in the marketplace than some people would give 
credit to. And 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 I you know I think what the the picture you're painting is one of displacements and of opening up of other opportunities uh, in some ways. Um, and we get this anyway. I've got to say that I'm getting a lot of approaches on, on uh, is, from Instagram because of what I've been generating, and I won't go into the details. But um, recently, I was invited to redesign Seattle. <laughs> it's not something I could do very easily. But nonetheless, there are these opportunities. But then you begin to think, well, how are they remunerated? In a sense, you know, we know how architects traditionally be paid. But if when you're working, let's say in the metaverse, and you're 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 doing a, a kind of digital model of something, or you know, how do you, how do you, we well, don't have any kind of structure that's at least become, uh, that's kind of solidified in, in the marketplace of how a designer is being, is, well, maybe we do, maybe those who work in the world of metaverse know exactly how much they've been, been paid, but it remains a bit of a mystery for most, for most architects, how they could survive in that domain. And yet it's very clear that that's opening up, that the world of, Let's say gaming um, is something that maybe architects should could be involved in, uh, and designers in general. Yeah, I mean that's really interesting. So I think I think really, if I had to summarize your point, it's that the technology creates new domains where ideas can sort of seep from one field to the other. So maybe from architecture and design to game development, for example. And I agree completely that this is something that you sort of feel out as you go, right? So this is like. Uh, Thomas Kuhn's paradigm shifts because of advances in one field, enabling new ways to new creativity, new novelty in another field. Um, and yeah, like you said, I could really imagine that as game engines got more powerful, there's uh, an opportunity now to have more realistic design, like for example, a cityscape for your, for your game or Grand Theft Auto or something. Uh, and exactly what that means for something like the metaverse, where sort of real estate is uh, very cheap, if you will. Uh, I'm not really sure what, what that will mean for architecture, except that it seems like an example of this Kuhnian cross-pollination effect that can lead to real novelty, in my opinion. Well, I, I, I think that it's, it, it shifts us out of the, because it always, it's always tempting to kind of think in, in terms of the actual physical world and, and to just apply those so, same context. But I think that shifts us possibly from the construction is to the gaming industry. And I think that the, that actually a driver of change in the future is going to be that. I mean, it, I think it was in the first place. I mean, GPUs, I think, came out of the gaming industry you know, to begin with. And I suspect that if we do have more free time on our hands, I would be thinking it's the gaming industry is going to do well out of that. You know? but, uh, so it's a different paradigm, a different mode of, of operation. Yeah, sure. And I would also offer that, um, you know, these neural network like applications like GANs, for example, often neural networks underneath, those are enabled in advances by advances in computer hardware, right? GPUs became better and cheaper and now everyone can use them to run neural networks. So, you know, I think Kuhn has the right idea here. Yeah, yeah. So um, I, I, I just want to repeat this. Anyone who's got any questions out there? I want to just, maybe if I, I, I don't want to put um, Michal on the spot, but I just wanted to maybe uh, invite him to comment. Uh, he put a, a comment in the chat about payment. I mean, uh, Michal is part of the Digital Futures team. Uh, he's mentioned he's a, uh, he's quite a renowned artist in the world of art himself, quite a, an accomplished artist, but also now undertaking PhD in this area. Michal, do you want to comment on this discussion so far, especially from the world of art and how you see comparisons or distinctions between um, art production and, 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 and the design world in general. Yeah, for sure, Neil. Thank you. And hi, Aaron. Hi, I'm on a wonderful conversation. And uh, I, have, I have a lot of notes and um, <laughs> certainly a lot of questions and remarks here to make. But one I've been thinking about um, is that I mean, as we use AI in, in the studio all the time as part of larger projects, and as you say in the paper, it's a tool, certainly, it's an artist in its own right, although that's interesting to sort of think about sometime in the future. Um, but what, I, what I'm, let's say, interested in, and in some ways maybe concerned about is I wonder if, if you look at the history of art, and artists have, in a sense, you know, they have... Um, taken the tools they're given and we've sort of uh, manipulated them. We've just sort of reverse engineered them. We played with them, we hacked them. I wonder if AI 
is in a sense, maybe the first tool that at least makes that a lot harder in a way because the literacy or the understanding or the equipment or the whatever is just, um, it's just a lot, a lot further out of reach for artists to, um, to, um, um, to work with in that way. We can take what we're given, we can use it, we can generate things. Um, but I fear that it's a, it's in a sense a kind of a, for many artists and myself to a certain extent included, is a kind of a black box. So I wonder if, if we think of art as a kind of, in a way, a potentially diversifying force representing the worlds of the world in a way, and then is there a tendency towards the um, the generic, I feel sometimes it's precisely because it becomes harder to situate. And these are more like sort of universal models with huge data sets. We don't know exactly what's in them. We don't know exactly what are the tools that we're actually working with. Sometimes I feel that way. I wonder if some of that resonates with you and what are your perspectives potentially also on the future of generative AI in that way? Yeah, I would say that we're like waiting to see how these tools get incorporated into interfaces that are a little more useful, right? So yes, many people are working with Midjourney or Chat GPT by going to OpenAI's website or Midjourney's website and interacting with it that way. But we're gonna see moving forward that these large language models and, and the companies that produce them uh, I expect they start to be treated a little more like utilities, while other entities, other other people create the actual tools built on top of the utility. And that those creators that create these, these, these interfaces will be more curated towards target audiences. So hopefully what that would create, uh, what it would lead to is a tool that has artists in mind, even in very specific contexts. So working with graphic designers, working with blog writers, working with journalists, different tools for each type of worker that's tailor-made for them, such that the AI part is kind of, it's just behind the scenes, right? So we're really working towards, uh, you know, good technology is indistinguishable from magic. And I would say that what you're, what you're highlighting is it's not quite there, even though generative AI tools are pretty amazing. Uh, in their own right. Right. Uh, maybe oh, I could just... Aaron's I muted. I think there's some good points, but I, I, would, I would phrase them slightly differently. I think, um, you know, we've always had tools that um, many artists do not necessarily know how they work. Like you, you can drive a car without knowing how a combustion engine works and you can point a camera without understanding um, chemical uh, processes of film developing or carbon uh, or CCD, you know, um, photon collection. Um, but, you know, so artists learn the phenomenology, they learn the affordances, they learn the, you know, the interface of how to use the thing. Um, not, they don't necessarily need to understand the workings necessarily, although the more that they do, the the richer their uh, control and experimentation will be. Um, and there, are, I, I wanna point out, there are examples of great artists who innovated in part through innovating the technology. But I, I think the thing that is, um, very new and different now is that the um, these different tools can embed very specific decisions in them. And I think that you're alluding to this, that like the, the, the way the trained data set is trained and the mitigations that the authors of the data set use to try to protect, prevent bias, prevent misinformation. And there are all, all those things are always imperfect. That will really affect the quality of the outputs. And I think someone who's very determined uh, and skillful can make the output they want. They're not going to be limited by the limitations of the model. But um, it definitely makes certain kinds of outputs easier to make than others. And different models are going to guide people towards different kinds of culture to some extent. Yeah, we um, just definitely second uh, Morgan's point that there's going to be more targeted tools for different audiences and different applications. Yeah, we discussed a little bit, especially in the white paper, uh, the concern about sort of the flywheel uh, that can be created if so many people create content using these tools and don't add their own creativity, their own novelty to it. There's a sense that as we continue to train future iterations of these systems, they kind of stabilize on their own content. They start learning from their own content. And it's unclear what this inbreeding would mean for future iterations of these systems too. So uh, again, sort of a, a need to reveal, uh, peel back the black box a little bit. 
that I think everybody would agree we need, whether you're a creative or so, uh, somebody working for one of these uh, large language model companies, uh, this is a problem that I think everyone should be paying attention to. Yeah, th thank you for these remarks. Yeah, yeah, just briefly, I, I, of course, Aaron, I mean, you're right, of course, you know, I wouldn't understand how a car exactly works down to the details. I just feel, um, again, to to reiterate um, that with AI, the first time I feel I've always tried to have some un basic understanding of what I'm working with and how sort of I can customize it to my own, in a sense, um, you know, um, interests, objectives, orientations, and I I guess I, I just, um, you know, with AI for the first time, I feel there is a very, very powerful, wonderful, you know, um, technology and tool here that um, that um, still <laughs> um, sort of is, is elusive in the sense that in, in the sense that the outputs I'm getting or what I am, what's it, what's it, what it delivers, so to speak, I have a hard time tracing back and sort of understanding Again, to which degree we can debate. Of course, there is a limitation to that every t and you know at all times. But again, I I just feel that um, as I said before, and as you said, yeah, we we have we're going to have more sort of customized, situated versions of these, and I look forward to that. Um, but I think I, for for me, just, or historically speaking, which I'm not an art historian at, at all, but I think there's something happening here which is quite remarkable and quite, of course, I don't want to you know I don't mean to um, to uh, um, make it sound like this is sort of dystopian. I think this is, in fact, could be quite the opposite, but it is, I think still it's quite remarkable what's happening here. And I, I'm not sure if there's if there's a, a real precedent in the history of art in, 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 in that regard. Anyway, yeah. Well, I, I would say that almost all uh, big artistic disruptions have each one is disrupted, uh, unprecedented. Photography changes way, art in ways that was really unprecedented. And, you know, filmmaking and recorded music, all these things, um, uh, at the time, people said it's killing art. It's unprecedented. It's terrible. It's it's amazing. Uh, I feel like the the difference is there are unique things happening now, but um, I think mm -hmm. it's better to, to view them within the lens of of these kinds of technological disruptions. At, and and uh, I, I push back when people say nothing like this has ever happened before. Right. Right. Yeah. Fair point. Fair point. Yeah. Yeah. No, I just want to uh, uh, drop something into the conversation and. Um... <clears throat> You know, looking at this this question about you know the artist doesn't understand quite what's going on, but somehow you know whatever you know can work with the system. Um, and actually, there is a there is an argument to say that that um, that that if you're working at the coal face, you're so engrossed in the coal face that you can't step back and see things with a level of abstraction. I mean, in England we have this expression: you can't see the wood for the trees. In other words, what we mean by it, you can't get a sense of the totality of the, the forest or the wood because all you can see individual trees in front of you. And I certainly found this from a personal experience. I was I was working when I came out of college. I worked on a translation of uh, of Alberti from Latin, right? And, and it's treatise on architecture. And I I knew every word. I knew every word. You know, it was really it was I was immersed in it. And someone said to me. Uh, invited me to come and give a lecture at the Architectural Association. And I, I said, I can't do that. I can't do that. But it's interesting, you know, sometimes you need to have this level of abstraction to comment on these things. And I just wanted to, to raise, um, and it's not just, I think, not just artists and architects, but also, let's say, cultural commentators or, or uh, uh, and the person I'm thinking about is, is Yuval Harari. And I wanted to, to raise his position um, in some sense. I, I saw, I mean, he was in discussion with uh, um, um, what's his name, with Mustafa Suleiman recently, and uh, came up with a slightly apocalyptic view in some senses. But there was the comment that was made in the chat was, "Well, what's an historian got to do with this? You, know, you want to find out about these things? You ask Sam Altman, or you ask whatever Elon Musk, or whatever. You know, you've asked someone working in the domain of um, of computer science. And we, you know, why is an historian or a, a kind of, I don't know what, how you describe uh, Yuval Harari because he's not a, a straightforward historian, but you know, why is he given any credibility? I mean, I don't want to float that out there, especially to, to Aaron as who's kind of like, is dealing with the technology itself and whether, whether would you accept Aaron the, 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 the role of someone like Yuval Harari or do you think it's irrelevant? Um, I definitely think that just computer science points of views are not enough. And it's important to look at the history, the sociology, economics, obviously, 
Um, these things exist within a culture and within the context of history. And this is why I keep bringing up historical examples that we can learn from all these things that have happened in the past that are similar in some ways and different in others. Um, and so, I mean, without commenting on Harari specifically, like I, I absolutely think that we need these different points of view and different sources of information to understand the future given the lessons of history, as well as the lessons of what these things are doing now. Yeah, I'd say in economics, there's a sort of a rich history of economic historians trying to find parallels to previous disruptions in technology, for example, so, you know, Luddites and bank tellers, these examples are pointed to all the time in this body of literature because they show us lessons about what's going to happen today with whatever the new disruption is. The details might be different, like Aaron said, but oftentimes there are these prevailing trends that you can lean on and rely on as you try to forecast what happens. So I think you need input from both. Uh, sort of the people acting at the frontier and the people who have looked at similar examples in the past. So um, we have a question from Lorena. Maybe I could invite Lorena to switch on her video and uh, unmute herself and to ask that question. Lorena, welcome. Thank you so much for this really exciting uh, conversation. Um, I was just curious about this comment um, because it's something that I've, I've been trying to wrap my head around as well in terms of the ancestral sort of AI referencing itself and what might occur when that happens. Um, but I'm curious if you suspect that there might be at some point value in creating um, you know, a data set of original human works that are really sold as one-offs, almost as this minted NFT won't be used for any other purpose other than to train this new kind of AI as if you're, you know, creating again. And then in that regard, we would have no issues with copyright. It would be, you know, this, this data set would be used truly nowhere else on the internet, but it may actually provide also just thinking from a humanist lens for a moment, it may actually say that, you know, the human input has uh, a value that is much higher than perhaps it was before because now we're able to generate these images, um, you know, in rapid fire effectively in a free way, but to have an original human work is actually takes a lot of time and craft to, to produce. So I was just curious about your thoughts on that. I think the most likely solution to um, the issue of AI training itself is going to be filters and detecting. Oh, the, these images from the web are actually, you know, more recent, you know, post twenty twenty three, or they have the signature of having been generated by these models. Um, um, I think the thing is, like, the, the training for these things is so enormous, billions of images often, that the value of any given work and the impact that any given input image has is so tiny that it's not clear. Um, that uh, you could design large enough data sets without you know, paying people lots of money for it. Um, uh, that would, it's not clear that they would match the value of, of um, data sets or gathered other ways. Yeah, I agree with Aaron. Like it's, um, I think there, there will be, a, there's always gonna be a value on sort of, sort of artisanal goods. Uh, and this is what we saw in the industrial revolution, for example, where the handmade stuff became sort of luxury items. Uh, but in terms of this training issue moving forward, it's just so easy to out volume handmade stuff, right? Like I could produce a dozen images a second. Uh, and even if half of those are garbage, as long as some of them are mediocre, uh, it's just a big volume for handmade fine goods to, to keep up with. So and I agree with Aaron too that you know basically until we have sort of digital signatures, we have uh, solved this sort of digital provenance issue, then it's going to be a tough problem without that, without the ability to filter. Oh, thank you. Matt Morgan, can I just go back just, uh, I, I remember another question I wanted to ask you. Um, uh, the question of history, I mean, at the uh, going back to Yuval Harari and need for historians, I mean, the comment that 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 uh, Martin Ford makes is, of course, we've got examples of this, you know, of, you know, and things happening in the past, and famously he talks about how all the horses got unemployed when the, when the car was invented, kind of thing. Um, and, and there are many examples one can point towards in the Luddites and so on. But his point is that, but this is different um, in this this situation right now, um, in the sense that. Um, uh, 
First of all, I think the domain of AI is going to really have an impact across pretty much every single discipline. It's not going to be limited to one. It's going to be, it's going to, it's going to the, the implication, the challenges are going to spread throughout. So it's not as though you can easily shift from one domain into another. That other domain is probably going to be facing the same, the same challenges. Um, and you know, I, 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 and the other question that he, he, he says, well, this is something that is. It's it's you know where the car was came along and horses were unemployed, but but we've now got a learning model which is very very different to all those 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 questions. To what extent are we in a different situation now to the historical precedents that we could point towards? Yeah, um, so I would say that there are as least as many people who have said this time is different throughout history as there are studies about actual changes in history. Right. So my favorite example, which I, I double check just to just to be sure, is uh, the earliest version of this time is different and we should be worried about automation that I could find comes from Plato's uh, Phaedrus, where he's worried about the technology of writing displacing human memory and reading, right? So we're not really worried about that as much anymore. We've sort of evolved past that. Um, so I, uh, I feel like there's sort of a rich history of, of this type of concern and we sort of find our way through it moving forward as well. Um, so uh, I don't I don't I don't share that concern. I would also say that I really do subscribe to this body of work from economic complexity, uh, which is maybe not quite mainstream labor economics, but sort of adjacent to it. You can see a lot of researchers, uh, folks like Ricardo Hausman and Cesar Hidalgo would sort of be the, the pole bearers for this field. And one of the things they argue is that technology is an encoding of our knowledge and our ability, right? We all go to the store, we buy toothpaste. Toothpaste has encoded in it manufacturing technology or knowledge, uh, chemical knowledge, all these things that you know I don't know about. I presume you and Aaron also don't know about, and yet we're able to exchange this knowledge for dollars or for other goods and services. Uh, and so in this paradigm, where technology is an encoding of, of human knowledge, that's exactly what this large language model is. And it's actually very easy to see. It's two types of knowledge. We learned a lot about how neurons work and that leads to neural networks and GANs and so on. Uh, even if we sort of start to move away from literally how the brain works, there's still, uh, that's the starting point and we've moved from there. And then in terms of the training data uh, used for these systems, it's very literally just taking stuff we've said on the internet which some of it is, is knowledge and some of it is noise, uh, but we're using it to train these systems as well. So it's a very literal encoding of human knowledge, human uh, understanding into these systems. So I think that's that's part of what's going on here. But maybe I could just pick up on that question about the the kind of the the, the de-skilling, as it were, that this might lead to. There was a comment that was made um, by Douglas Rushkoff. Um, I don't know if you know him as a New York. Um, based writer about technology, uh, and he produced one particular book. And I involved him in the first conference I organized on digital design. It was actually very interesting and illuminating. And he made this comment that, um, you know, you can take the view that, okay, you know, we're turning into this Beavis and Butter generation where we can't spell, we can't add up, and whatever. The kind of Prince Charles view, as I kind of met, it used to be the case, right? He's like King Charles anyway. But, uh, but anyway, the, that view that things are going downhill, what's happened to all these things? But what the point that Douglas Rushkoff makes is that actually that, that in fact there are new skills emerging that would be totally invisible to someone like Charles and they wouldn't he wouldn't recognize them like multitasking in fact you know so what, while one domain begins to lose its significance another one reappears and, and to some extent you know that also echoes some of the comments that are being made by another commentator in the world of, well, he's, he's a philosopher of science, basically, but um, in the world of architecture, it's a guy called Manuel, Manuel Delanda, who is um, a kind of Deleuzean, let's say, based, at least he was, Deleuzean theorist, who, and he says, what's happening now is that the notion of straightforward creativity, um, or whatever will be used for that, has been displaced, and we still use our creativity, but it's in terms of the, of the, the processes. The, so the creativity goes from straight from the immediate production to the controlling of processes. Does that make sense? Um, yeah, but I would say that, you know, really good technology uh, doesn't require too much oversight in that way, right? Like good technology should be 
easy to use. The cost of using it should not exceed the value of what's produced, right? Uh, and so I, I don't, I'm not so sure that that's sort of the problem moving forward. In terms of de-skilling and new skills, um, I think the de-skilling issue is really not what has played out historically on aggregate when you look at a population level. Uh, because like you mentioned, technologies often create new opportunities. There's new combinations of things. Um, even if a lot of those combos are not interesting, maybe some of them really are, and, and there's a new skill set. So maybe the go-to example for uh, something like large language models would be this skill of prompt engineering, which if you look at recent job postings data, you will find that there are postings with employers requesting uh, prompt engineering uh, as a skill. However, exactly how long lived these sort of hypey buzzwords are remains to be seen for, for this case. So uh, I suspect, for example, that prompt engineering is really just the ability to specify what it is you want and that uh, having these this sort of prompt engineering two, two word phrase for that might not survive. Um, but there will be other new, maybe new skills, maybe just re-emphasizing skills that we already have words for elsewhere that um, will start to be more emphasized. So for, for example, with the bank teller example, bank tellers shifted from money and handling and numeracy skills to basically requiring more social skills. And I could imagine that type of thing also playing out for artists who, if they do have to scale up the number of contracts they take on, maybe that requires more energy spent interacting with customers rather than focusing on the creative process. Uh, and if that's the case, you could imagine it that their work requires more social skills than what they were doing previously. Maybe a, a Deepti Zachariah has a question. Deepti, are you able to switch on your camera and, and uh, unmute yourself and ask your question? Yes. Hi, Hi Deepti. Hi. Hi, thank you very much. Uh, it's been a fascinating talk. And I did enjoy reading your article as well because it was concise. And um, I have a question. Um, I think it's refreshing in a way in our dark side of AI series to have a, maybe a slightly less alarmist uh, perspective. Um, and certainly your way of setting aside AI as more as a software system rather than artificial intelligence and in that, I guess, science fiction way helps us maybe ask more tempered questions. Um, so my question is really looking at AI as a tool. And um, I know you've been resisting the idea that this is truly unprecedented in um, technological terms in history, but there are certainly some aspects that are unpre unprecedented about AI. One is the speed at which it's advancing and the access that, you know, millions of people are getting access to this tool, um, and a tool that we don't really understand cognitively because, you know, we're not getting the responses from our hands or, you know, our usual, I guess, sensory uh, systems. Um, now, as artists and designers, we become masters when we kind of understand a tool well, and we know how to manipulate a tool well. This particular tool is a bit of a black box. They say it's a black box even for people building the tool. Um, the question is, how do you foresee a future of designers or creative people mastering a tool, an AI tool, um, especially since it already has a degree of agency in this create in the creative process? I think it is a really good point about the accelerating pace of the change. Um, and that is, that is, I think, um, a, a trend. So photography, 1838, you know, the presentation of the daguerreotype, Kodak cameras, 60 or 70 years later. Um, I think social media is an example of a technology which has had much more rapid impact. And that's definitely something we have not figured out how to uh, fix its uh, harms on society. Um, but in terms of develop the uh, mastery of the tools, I think a lot of art professional artists now, at least in the visual arts domain, professional artists master a particular stage of a tool. They learn 
Maya or they learn, um, you know, their, their favorite, you know, photography applications or whatever. And then they're very, they tend to fix in that particular thing. Like if you move one menu item from this menu to here, they're like, like, I don't understand what, what do you do to my the tool, which makes sense that, you know, like a violin, I think is an example of, a, of an artistic tool that is hard to use. And yet uh, people can make great stuff with it. And if you start thinking with the violin uh, and add buttons to it and automation, then the, the artists who have mastered it will get really upset. So um, that's a long way of saying, I think there will be sort of snapshots of these tools that people will get very good at. Um, and there are some people who will just like, okay, I am good at film photography. I am good at um, this thing or that thing. And I mean, I, I know one artist who is just focusing just in deep dreams, uh, Daniel and Brosi. And there are other artists who are just focusing on GANs, even though those are not the cutting edge of uh, AI art anymore, that they're just focusing on this tool. So people will have these sort of snapshots of skills at times and then retrain or re-update their skills uh, periodically. Yeah, I would add that the way we educate the next generation of artists can change. It changes all the time to reflect the tools available at that time, right? Like there was a time where an art, art education required no digital education. Uh, and now, of course, many fields from music to graphic design, uh, there's a there's a digital component there. So, you know, just understanding how to work with software uh, was not a thing in art at one point. And then now, of course, it is. So I can imagine that just the way we train people uh, will adapt uh, to new tools. We get this conversation we're having about folks in the workplace. You could just as easily have it about uh, professors and, and teachers and what we do mm -hmm. in terms of pedagogy. And for, I think for the teaching side also, um, there's lots of skills that you learn in, in these different um, uh, areas of expertise that persist that... Um, uh, like, you know, my, I, I, I learned painting and drawing by hand, and then I switched to doing digitally and experimenting with other tools. And some of the, the skills are very, very different, but a lot of the appreciation and judgment and decision-making around pictures is similar. I imagine architecture, the skills from you know, drafting physically versus using CAD software, Blender, or SketchUp, or whatever it is in the future, um, they have their definite te technical skills, but the understanding of space and thinking about how you mm -hmm. go through a process, that stuff is, is very... Um, stuff you keep through. And one last anecdote, um, when I, I used to use, work at Pixar and I, I heard the story that, and it, this may not be true anymore, um, applicants to Pixar would say like, what software should I learn in order to apply to work at Pixar? And the answer was always, we don't care which software, we're gonna teach you the software that we use. You should learn how to animate and, and that could be drawing pictures and mm. learning how to act and express yourself through, express character through movement on pictures. And that was not about the, the tools, but about the, the higher level skills that uh, the students were learning. I, uh, yeah, I, I really uh, resonate with that last uh, anecdote because um, I, I, I do think that tools are, I mean, we sort of, there's so much debate around tools, but less debate about what uh, an actual art form or skill might be removed from a tool of course their mastery of tools but yeah the basic of um, the basics of knowing how to build a building or play the I mean the violin is music is a different thing altogether but yes thank you very much for that <laughs> we've got a couple of questions um one from Gustavo and then from Misery Gustavo if you'd like to uh, um switch your camera on and meet yourself Gustavo, I should say, is a postdoc at UC Santa Barbara um, with a background in architecture. Gustavo. Uh, yes, hello, Aaron. I posted a few uh, uh, questions, but I, I'm going to kind of summarize real quickly. I think in, in, uh, in my experience, I've come through the trajectory of art and architecture. And in the media arts, I've worked with this facility called the Allosphere. And I think we've talked about this previously. Uh, it's a mixture of art and science. And when I think about these questions, in my uh, experience dealing with engineers and computer scientists, you know, there's been kind of this mismatch. Uh, you know, the engineers want to build the tool, and even in my um, university, ethics and the understanding of humanities is really not, um, let's say, supported within the foundational structures of computer science and engineering. I mean, one of the questions I would say is, uh, why not? Uh, and then secondly, in the humanities, uh, coding and the understanding of language and logic within the computer um, isn't really taught either. 
it sounds as though that we need a kind of a a, a paradigm shift, and I'm going to use a, that uh, term to to really look at education and industry hand in hand, so that we can make instead of making the tool and breaking society, why aren't we using the knowledge that we have of, of history and really make these algorithms more um, humane so we're not breaking things? Uh, this It's a larger question, but I'm coming at this trained more in as a, uh, looking at it as a, a practitioner and, and instead of a, a scientist, but I have to work with scientists. And, and that has been a struggle to even get to respecting my education as a designer and a, and, um, and a keeper of humanist knowledge. How do we actually make it more of this equitable playing field of research? Yeah, those are some deep questions. I don't know. Um, I think, you know, the, and there's lots of sources for these things that you're talking about, so you're partly just the um, uh, siloification of knowledge. It's just not possible for, you know, any one person to be expert in everything, and we end up, you know, breaking up, dividing up academia into these different domains, and people come expert in their domain, and cross-disciplinary knowledge is hard to come by, uh, and even hard to have empathy across uh, disciplines. Um, I think um, when you ask why there's no uh, ethics training in computer science, I think, um, uh, you know, one reason, of course, there's just so many things to study right now. People complain, like, why aren't students learning architecture or statistics or, um, you know, I, I had electrical engineering in my computer science ed education that I don't know that students are going to have now. Um, but I think, you know, the, the deeper argument is that uh, computer scientists historically have we, more, than, more than 10 years ago, there was not really any kind of like discussion of the ethical impacts of this research outside of some concerns around military research and surveillance um, that a few isolated people had. Um, uh, it's, you know, are we see ourselves as mathematicians who are solving fundamental scientific questions that, uh, and it's up to uh, other people to figure out how those things are used. It's kind of, I think, the common view. Um, and I think there's another view, which I think is uh, resonated a little bit more with it, is that it's hard to uh, assess. It's hard to to really understand the, the impact of a tool at the time that you're building it. Um, uh, but I think that, you know, that, that is a little bit of a cop out to say like, oh, it doesn't matter because I think the real impact that computer scientists are having is that researchers should be thinking more about is the words that they use. Like I just like the word artificial intelligence, I think is just so harmful. Um, and uh, but, you know, we're stuck with it. Um, and so the way that these things are presented publicly, I, that I see as being the real place where I, I wish computer scientists were um, uh, doing a better job at communicating what does this stuff really do and how does it really work and had a better understanding of the, the broader impacts. But I think it's really, relatively within the past 10 years or so that there's been just even understanding that, these, that this stuff exists in a broader context that uh, has potential for harm and not just, you know, cool new stuff. Um, yeah. Wanna, that answers one part of your question. Yeah, go ahead, Barton. Yeah, I just want to agree with Aaron that um, it's a philosophical question, and I'm sure we could find a lot of people who disagree. But, but I, I agree that you know we want people who are innovating, uh, even if they can't imagine the negative outcomes of their advance. Right? Like when we were building the infrastructure for electricity, we weren't thinking about the internet at that time. Right? It was unimaginable, and yet it's essential to the internet as we know it. Right? So we don't want to hamstring uh, those innovators, uh, but there are ways to create guardrails. You know, for example, uh, Stanley Milgram ran some scientific experiments that society determined we shouldn't do science that way anymore. And we have created things like internal review boards to prevent certain forms of research from happening. So there are tools to create guardrails where necessary, uh, even for the scientific process. Uh, on the other side of your question, you know, what about folks on the humanities side, uh, do they need to learn coding? Uh, I think, yeah, there's probably a value to that for the folks who want to be multidisciplinary, but it seems like a very steep cost. It seems like a very diverse set of tools that that person is signing up to learn. Uh, on the other hand, we're seeing that really good tools, technological tools, they often don't require coding as they become more and more useful. So interacting with ChatGPT, you don't need to know about coding in order to do that. Uh, you can even find many services today that allow you to create whole websites without writing any code, for example. 
So, you know, these interfaces are meant to democratize access to these tools. And I think that that's, everybody's aware of that value. And that's really where uh, creating an interface for non-technical folks to interact with these tools. Yeah. Well, Morgan, I wanted to jump in for a second because you actually said something that really caught my ear. The idea that the tool also is a quote, the tool actually is some sort of encapsulation of human knowledge. Yeah. I mean, I think um, some of the follow-up questions I brought up are, are we sure it is the encapsulation of human knowledge? It's a certain type of human knowledge. And I think that's where you see other groups and other researchers saying, you know what, it is a slice of a certain type of human knowledge. It doesn't really take into account what you're talking about with the guardrails. And I think talking about um, science and AI in these absolute terms, I would agree with you, it's harmful. Because I think I've I've been in years of debate with what is AI. Uh, you know, how do you look at machine learning and how it, does it really, you know, can you believe the results at a certain level, even at the atomic level in material science? Like what is real and what is not real unless you can measure it. But going back to knowledge, I think that's where I would love to see more debates between the scientists and the humanists in these practical terms. Like what, what can the guardrails be? Um, how can that aid to think tanks and policymakers to make real change that can, um, I think, um, encourage human development or economic development? Because what I see going on is that there is such an economic disparity. Uh, I'm not sure if Neil used it before, but, you know, uh, there was a science fiction movie that, you know, there's certain people thousands of years that, that you know, de-evolve and there's others that completely evolve. And they, you know, I forgot which one that was. But the, I'm... Idiocracy, the time machine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, but I'm curious uh, with um, both of you, when you speak also with, it's an encapsulation of human knowledge. I am not so sure because why don't we have programs to code ethical guardrails within these technologies or have industries of these libraries available. So if Google creates this tool that could be uh, seen as an equivalent of a nuclear bomb, it could transform entire civilizations. Why don't we have industries that create these algorithmic guardrails uh, that are government approved that won't harm creativity? You'll just see a curb. Like why has that not been proposed or has it been proposed? I don't know. Yeah, so I mean, maybe I can be a little clearer about what I mean by technologies encoding human knowledge. Maybe the easiest way to think about this is that if I write a program, if I write code that solves a certain type of math problem, it's because I've figured out how to solve that math problem and I'm just writing down the steps. So I'm encoding my knowledge in that case. So of course, this is overly simplistic and the, you know, what, what large language models are doing is much more complicated, but it's encoding our knowledge about neural networks and it's encoding our knowledge more generally from the training data, the things that we've stated online on Wikipedia, for example. Uh, and so in that way, we're encoding human knowledge into these systems. And that, that, that's the position that folks like Ricardo Hausman at Harvard and uh, Cesar Hidalgo, who's at University of Toulouse, that, that's the position that they would take. But your question about exactly where society should insert guardrails uh, is really interesting. Um, and I can elaborate on my position on this too, is that I don't want to, I don't think we need many guardrails on the research part. If there, but there's a limit, there are cases where we've inserted guardrails into scientific enterprise and it's been a good thing. It's when you start to deploy technology that the guardrails I think ne we need to be considering. That's where the impact can really scale uh, beyond just, you know, a few researchers at one university playing with a tool to all of a sudden all society playing with the tool. That's the thing. There are repositories where people just post tons of, for example, digital knowledge. Uh, GitHub would be an example of a place where tons of people post software to solve all kinds of problems across many different domains. It's not highly regulated, but it is this sort of repository of human knowledge and encoding of things in a way that's democratic. Anybody, I, I mean, maybe not everybody, but it, there's a pretty low barrier to entry to start working with code from GitHub on your own computer if you wanted to. 
Maybe I could uh, bring in Misery um, Patel, um, who's asked a question. Uh, Misery is uh, currently teaching uh, at uh, Carnegie Mellon uh, University and is an architect from originally from India. Misery, welcome. She's up the street. Yes, thank you, Neil. Um, uh, really, really interesting provocations. And, um, and it, this in some ways also opens up conversations for AI to seep into a lot of disciplines for us to kind of, in some ways, find an excuse to collaborate almost. And um, although the, uh, these questions and provocations sort of delved into, into uh, the multifaceted relationship between AI and technological and ethical and societal implications. I wonder as a paradox, um, what in your opinion uh, uh, are, are the challenges or opportunities in integrating AI into the creative design process for specifically manufacturing or additive manufacturing? Because also as a, as a trend, um, with the advent of 3D printing, it wasn't just falling under the manufacturing sector or mechanical engineering or industrial design, but it, it was really a tool that a lot of disciplines sort of took up and sort of ran with it, which also catapulted designers or architects into uh, looking at coding or looking at generative design. So I, I, I wonder what your thoughts are in terms of what opportunities might emerge by integrating AI into the manufacturing process or more specifically additive or robotic fabrication techniques, which would then serve as a, as a tool for designers to come together with material scientists, the construction industry and such. Yeah, so go, go ahead, Aaron, you look like you're yeah. ready. Um, yeah, so I think you're know, not being a domain expert in those areas. It does seem like those are places where there's opportunities for domain experts to work with um, uh, AI techniques to, to identify places where there are hard decisions that can be automated and integrate those into those design workflows. Like I think you know one difference between physical manufacturing and additive manufacturing from making images that like, you know, you generate an image in uh, mid journey, it doesn't have to be something you could actually realize as a real building or even like physically plausible. Um, when you generate um, physical designs, it has to be something you can physically manufacture that it's gonna stand up, you know, and it supports in the you know, production device. And so um, there's algorithmic challenges in and workflow challenges in figure out how do you um, have the benefits of both worlds of, of automation that's gonna build a thing that you can actually build. And you know, there's lots of research, like people doing kind of stuff like that now. So there's definitely that, that stuff will happen and can be done. Yeah, I'd say that um, you know, the, the task is for people with domain knowledge to work with the folks uh who know how these generative AI systems work to create these tailored interfaces for all these specific use cases. Um, so for example, I doubt very much that anybody who works for open AI knows very much about manufacturing processes in specific plants, you know, but they they want to enable folks who do to use these tools in their domain and create these tailored interfaces. Uh, and I would suggest that we're pretty successful at this historically. If you are a little more flexible with what you include in your definition of AI, uh, linear regression is something that we teach kids in middle school and high school and uh, you know, in some sense, it's pattern recognition. It's a form of very simplistic form of AI and people use it across all domains and don't think much of it now. So I, I suggest that we're going to get there. It's just a matter of getting domain experts to interface with uh, these generative AI tools. Yeah, because in some ways, also uh, a few of the architects in this past decade have been really quick with incorporating machine learning to kind of think about tool pathing or how a robot moves in real time as well. And I, I think AI in some ways, in, instead of thinking about it as the dark side of AI, I think it's actually quite a hopeful scenario to be able to sort of integrate these onto uh, onto tools and processes that are pre-existing in nature. Yeah, I think the dark, the dark side, if you will, is really just trying to prepare for what the meta consequences of that are. I agree, it's exciting from an implementation standpoint, but figuring out socially and societally what that means is a very hard problem. Thank you. So maybe uh, Vasco has a, a question, and Vasco is in Bangladesh, and it's a 
I know Bangladesh is kind of, uh, Dhaka, it's kind of crazy there. It, it, it's very noisy there. So you, I, I'm going to read out his question, um, but you can see Vasco on, on, on your screen now. Um, Vasco is a professor in, uh, of architecture in, in Bangladesh. Um, so his question is this, uh, how can we ensure that AI algorithms used in creative processes are fair and unbiased, especially when it comes to cultural representations and economic opportunities. Let me read that again. How can we ensure that AI algorithms used in creative processes are fair and unbiased, especially when it comes to cultural representations and economic opportunities? Yeah, that's a really hard question. Uh, and there's a whole community of researchers focused on this in general. Uh, so I'm thinking about the fate research communities. This would be algorithmic fairness, ethics, and looking at representation. Um, it's a super hard problem, especially because even often asking these systems to explain their reasoning can be so challenging. Uh, so, you know, the, I would point to that, to that research. I have seen interesting proposals out there uh, that are sort of more abstract and more theoretical at this point, rather than something that can be practiced where you imagine building these marketplaces where people upload algorithms and other people upload certain tests to try to assess if a system exhibits a certain type of bias, yes or no. These uh, And there's this marketplace where algorithms are certified as passing or not passing these tests. And maybe that's a way to, um, a way to sort of democratize this and deal with the scalability of uh, representation in these systems. The difficulty is often in implementing such a system uh, and then also, also things like, you know, the ownership of these of these AI uh, source codes, which would need to be uploaded and stuff. So there's a lot of details that prevent that type of thing. Uh, and in any case, it just highlights that this is a really big problem. Yeah, and it's something that uh, a lot of people are, you know, people care about very much. Um, but uh, it's mm -hmm. also, uh, I think, some of the, the way the questions are, are being asked kind of make it sound like it's easy. Why aren't we just doing it? And I think it's actually really, really hard to design mm -hmm. algorithms it's not just hard to design algorithms, it's hard to formulate what exactly do we want? Like what is the criteria that determines, oh, this model is biased, it's unbiased? Because to design an algorithm or a test, you have to specify to something, that, something that can be computed, what is the test um, uh, that you, what is the standard? So like when Dolly was first released, you type in CEO, you get a bunch of white men, which is clearly unacceptable. And then um, you know, a few months later, they made this hack that was a very clearly it was very almost hilarious what they did to make it happen. But then you would like, it would be like one person would be like a different ethnicity in the pic, in the thing. And like, is that enough? Is that um, satisfactory? Probably not. But um, uh, saying exactly what you do want is actually really hard. And that's, um, and then that's, there's not going to be societal agreement, the government, you know, different governments might have different, uh, opinions in different cultures, different, you know, in different things in different contexts have different meanings. So I think these are all things are necessarily important, um, but it's quite a bit harder than it might sound than just saying, why not make them unbiased? Mm -hmm. um, I, the other point I want to make is that I feel like we have on the books lots of regulations around these areas that um, to some extent, <laughs> we just seem to enforce those now. Like, you know, I live in you know San Francisco where there are cars driving around without drivers right now. Like I see them all the time. Um, and I read about them breaking the laws and the police cannot ticket them or stop them because there is no human to ticket. And so there's basically no consequences for these cars breaking the law. And some of it is just, let's, you know, we have laws around copyright now that could be enforced um, in for derivative works, I think. Um, so like discrimination law and, you know, in ad targeting has been a big issue. Um, so make it possible to apply our current moral and ethical standards to the current systems. Like, I feel like that would go a long way towards addressing a lot of these concerns, not all of them, but it would be a big step. We have a question, um, from our YouTube audience. Maybe I can ask Michal to, uh, to read it out. Um, Michal, thanks. Thank you. Yes, sure. This is a question from Carnlin390. Uh, let me read it. Regarding fees, some studies show a growing gap between productivity and wage. Do you think a world that uses AI for workflows could close this gap? Or will designers be asked for more or less? For more for less. Sorry, correction. Um, 
Yeah. Um, so I suspect what might happen is that um, this this uh, gap in productivity versus median wages on average in the U.S. has been growing, and it doesn't look like it's going to slow down. There's a lot of factors that shape that aggregate result, but technology has has been thought to be one of those things, and it's because the folks who benefit from technological advance are those who have the ability to invest in it when it's new, and so usually it's it's wealthy people, it's people with capital, and it's not sort of the worker, the working class who doesn't have the capital to invest. Um, one thing that we we kind of skipped over in our discussion is that. Uh, these technological tools, historically, they democratize who can do certain types of work. So I talked about, for example, uh, artisans kind of being replaced by factory workers. Uh, and in that scenario, yes, a lot more people got involved in the production of textiles and ceramics, but they earned a lot less. Each person earned a lot less, uh, even though more people were employed. So the trade-off between these two factors can lead to increased uh, inequality. Um, and in, in the age of AI, I think we're, we're already sort of seeing this, like the uh, requirements to train an innovative new AI system are so steep that even just asking research institutions in the US, like MIT or Stanford, to do what OpenAI has done, it's completely unreasonable because mm -hmm. the cost is so prohibitive. Uh, so even within a developed Western society, it, it's it's impossible for for certain high power high profile institutions to get involved. Never mind developing countries who might want to have their own version of this tool. The way that we see developing countries interact with sort of these digital ecosystems is often through what economists call last mile jobs, where they're doing little bits of data curation or solving just that little bit that the AI system or the software system can't do on its own. So for example, if you need a training data set to uh, help your computer vision algorithm detect cats. You need a bunch of images where cats have been labeled. And that's something anyone in the world can do. Uh, and that's one way that anyone in the world can be involved with the digital economy. But it's certainly not a safe job. It's not um, high skilled. Uh, and you can see again that yes, being involved not, is not always raising all boats the same way. Uh, we we should uh, perhaps wrap things up. This has been an absolutely <laughs> really a, a mind blowing discussion. I'm really pleased that we uh, managed to have this today. Um, I think that we've managed to um, unpack a lot of the very very dense material in the in that article, which is a I think was what Echo Deepti's comment. I think it was an incredibly useful article and very uh, summarized the whole domain. But in some sense, it reminds me I always. I always can make this comparison to these, the cake you get and see on the panforte, which is a really, really dense, dense, dense cake, uh, cake. And to be able to unpack it and to really find out really what th there's more to this in a way, like a bit like a sponge, you could expand it. And I think this session has really helped to open up and expand upon and unpack some of those issues that have been raised. Um, I, I, I just want to uh, 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 thank uh, 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 Morgan and, and Aaron for their time on a Sunday morning, which is, I'm sure, there are better things to be able to do, to do but I think it's, you know, it's wonderful to see these ideas being shared out there with other people. And uh, um, so I want to thank you so much for this. I also want to thank Ziv, along with Aaron, for initiating this project, this particular article, which I thought was so important, and, and to Morgan and, in fact, the other members of this kind of global team that was assembled for um, to contribute towards this article, because that was astonishingly useful and all these insights. Um, and in fact, next week, we will be looking at the question of copyright, which to my mind was the really interesting question that came out of the article. So, I mean, I'm looking forward very much to that particular session. And it is super complicated. It's not, not so straightforward. This is what we need to hear. We need to be informed about some of these issues to avoid these kind of glib generalizations that are all too prevalent these days to really test it out and get the advice of experts. Because in the end, you know, while it does seem that we're kind of operating in a world where the the silos between different disciplines are breaking down. In the end, we still need experts. We still need informed opinions. And we need to find ways of, of sharing those opinions globally, which is what we're trying to do today. So um, I just want to thank everyone for being involved in this. And lastly, but not least, I really want to um, thank um, the team behind Digital Futures who've been putting this together. It's an incredible, selfless task. Um, 
Finally, finally, I should mention one thing I forgot to mention was uh, is Aaron himself, of course, has been posting some really great artwork onto Instagram. Maybe Aaron, you could just tell us what your Instagram uh, address is for that for the account where you posted all this stuff. It's, it's Aaron Hartsman. Um, yeah, uh, just. I mean, I just post my own drawings on my own Instagram, which is just my full name. Um, when Dolly came out about a year ago, I, I experimented with a lot, and I posted a bunch of stuff there. But that's that's dormant now. My AI art one. Okay, but anyway, it was it was a great contribution at the time. So anyway, thank you so much. And this is this is really you know simulated things, and I'm hoping this will kind of lead to other things to people undertaking research in this area and so on. I think this is an important contribution in many ways. I look forward to next particular week. Um, uh, to the question about copyright and the, and it's you know i just to say you know the 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 it's the provocation the dark side of ai has proved to be quite useful in terms of opening up and teasing out what the real issues are and uh and thanks again uh, morgan and, and and aaron for your incredibly inspired and, and informed opinions because these need to be shared out there we need to counter the 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 kind of the banalization of society with with this kind of informed, um, uh, uh, this, this, these, these, this important information. Fan, thank you so much. Um, and uh, hopefully see everybody next week. There's also going to be a session on Saturday, um, on the next few Saturdays. For those who are watching who haven't been seeing it, this is basically a series of tutorials about how you use Dali Mid Journey and so on, these diffusion models, with a roundtable discussion at the end involving some of the, the mo most significant uh, designers using these tools. So. Thank you so much. Amazing session. I really was really enjoyed this. And maybe some wonderful comments I've been getting on social media. Wow, this is incredible. So thank you. Thank you so much, everyone. So um, see you next week. Thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you again for the invitation. This is great. Yeah, absolutely fantastic. Thank you. Okay. All right.